All right, welcome back to ABA exam review in our BCBA task list study guide series. Today, we're continuing philosophical underpinnings with A3, describe and explain behavior from the perspective of radical behaviorism. We're gonna go through radical behaviorism, methodological behaviorism, and mentalisms. Very straightforward subject that is often misunderstood. So super important. As always, check out behavioranalystdata.com for all of our study materials. Be sure to subscribe. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in our Sunday shout out. As always, work hard, study hard. Let's go. All right, A3, radical behaviorism and methodological behaviorism. Radical behaviorism follows methodological behaviorism and was created by Skinner. That is the basics, right? Methodological behaviorists admit their private mental events, but do not consider them behavior to be analyzed. And that's often misunderstood. People think, well, methodological behaviorists just said they don't exist. It's not the case. They said, yes, we acknowledge there are few private mental events that happen within the skin that can't be observed. We're just not going to analyze them or consider them behavior. Skinner came around, right, and said, okay, well, I'm going to start including these private events in the understanding of behavior because methodological behaviorism is a very restrictive look. There's all these things going on inside of us all the time. We can't just ignore them as behavior because our interactions with the environment are driven as well by the things that happen inside of us. So Skinner decided to change his thinking. He launched radical behaviorism to include private events and the understanding of behavior. The question, who created radical behaviorism? Well, A and B, Watson and Pavlov, we think of respondent conditioning, right? Classical conditioning. Watson had the little Albert experiment. Pavlov had his dog. I think we all know that. C, Skinner. Skinner is our radical behaviorist creator. And then Sunberg, he is a very well-known researcher in verbal behavior, but he did not make private events or radical behaviorism. So Skinner is the one who included private events in our understanding of behavior and created radical behaviorism. So as we proceed, right, radical behaviorism concedes that thinking and feeling are no different from public events. So this is a huge a departure from methodological behaviorism who, who, who were saying, well, we're just not going to recognize those behaviors at all. So Skinner had three main points, and you want to know these, all right? If you know these three main points, you'll never get radical behaviorism confused again. First, and most importantly, private events, such as thoughts and feelings, are behavior. This is probably the biggest misunderstanding and mistake I hear from a uh, new behavior analyst or behavior analyst training to be behavior analyst, they continue to believe, well, thoughts and feelings aren't behavior because we don't study them in, in our, our practice, but that's just not true. All we're saying in our practice is we can't observe them, so we can't really change them. But radical behaviorism says private events, like thoughts and feelings, are in fact behavior. B, behavior within the body is only different because it cannot be observed or assessed, meaning all the stuff that's happening inside is no different than what we observe, except it can't be observed. So if it could possibly be observed, we would treat it like any other behavior that we can see on a day-to-day -day basis. And then finally, private events are influenced by the same thing that influence public events, meaning private events are no different than public events, except we can't observe them. That is the only thing separating private events from public events. They are feelings. I mean, they are behavior. Okay. They are influenced by the same thing that influence public events. We just can't see them. And again, I think this is the biggest misconception, right? Oh, well, thoughts and feelings, they're, we don't consider them behavior, the mentalisms, which we're about to talk about. So, you know, they're not behavior, but we acknowledge them. No, thoughts and feelings are behavior according to radical behaviorism. So question. If you're a behavior analyst writing a treatment plan, which of the following behaviors would you not target? Now, this is where it gets tricky, right? Because we acknowledge radical behaviorism, we acknowledge private events, but in practice, what are we looking to change as behavior analysts? Well, we're looking to change those observable events, right? Things we can see, things we can measure. So just because we acknowledge them as behavior doesn't necessarily mean we're going to treat them because if we can't observe them and measure them, it's going to be very difficult to change them. So you're writing a treatment plan. Which would you not target? A, a student rips up his work whenever he is offered help. Target ripping up work. Well, you can measure ripping up work. You can observe ripping up work. 
No problem there, right? B, a child punches holes in the wall because he is easily frustrated. Target frustration. Now, frustration. Are we going to target frustration or would you target punching holes? Well, you want to target punching holes. Why? Well, you can observe punching holes. You can measure punching holes. Frustration, right, is internal. It's private. We can't observe it. We can't measure it. It's going to be extremely, extremely, extremely difficult to change. See, a boy won't eat vegetables because he doesn't like how they taste. Target eating vegetables. Again, good. We can observe them eating vegetables. We can measure eating vegetables. So don't get it convoluted, right? Keep it very simple. Radical behaviorism, private events are behavior. Thoughts and feelings are behavior, but we can't observe them. We can't measure them. Therefore, we're likely never going to include them in our treatments because it's going to be really difficult to change them if we can't observe and measure them because we're always targeting things that are observable and measurable. And that's where I think the disconnect comes in, right? Just because we aren't including them doesn't mean they aren't behavior. So what would you not target? Well, you're not going to target frustration. You can target punching holes in the wall. You're just not going to target frustration. And then finally, we have to talk about mentalisms, okay? Mentalisms, right? These are our hypothetical constructs and explanatory fictions. The mentalism approach states that these things are the causes of behavior. Now, also misunderstood are mentalisms. We're not saying these don't exist, okay? So if we look at hypothetical constructs, which are private events believed to be present, things like ego, frustration, anxiety, we acknowledge these are real things. Okay, These things exist within us. However, it becomes an issue when we start offering explanatory fictions and we're starting to use these constructs to explain behavior. So the constructs, think of those as our terms. The explanatory fictions are when we start using these terms to explain behavior. Dave cannot pass his test because of anxiety. That is an explanatory fiction. Okay, This is an internal thing. We can't measure it. We can't observe it. We can't alter it right with our with by observation. So it's an explanatory fiction. Now, again, mentalisms exist, but should not be used to explain why behavior occurred. Very, very important, just like private events, right? Thoughts and feelings, their behavior, okay? Mentalisms exist, but we're not using them to explain why the behavior occurred. So once you start doing that, now you're going to explanatory fiction. We need to find a different reason Dave cannot pass his test, okay? Something like anxiety is just explaining it away using this hypothetical construct. So question, which of the following represents an explanatory fiction? So remember, an explanatory fiction, we're going to be explaining that a behavior is happening because of a construct. A, Lisa has been burned in the past, so she carefully lights the fireplace. So ask yourself, why does Lisa carefully light the fireplace? Because she's been burned in the past. Being burned in the past is a public event, observable, measurable. Totally fine. Lisa nervously lights the fireplace because she has been burned in the past. All right, careful. Why does she nervously light the fireplace? Because she has been burned in the past. So we're not saying she's lighting the fireplace because of the nerves. We're saying she's nervously doing it because she's been burned in the past. Not an explanatory fiction, okay? Her behavior, the cause of the behavior, is observable, measurable. See, Lisa has been burned in the past, so she carefully lights the fireplace because she is nervous. Hmm. So why does she carefully light the fireplace? Because she is nervous. That is an explanatory fiction. We're using this construct to explain why behavior is occurring. Again, radical behaviorism. Super simple, right? We start accepting that private events are behavior. Thoughts and feelings are behavior. But we can't observe them. We can't measure them, right? Mentalisms, okay? These are constructs and explanatory fictions. We acknowledge mentalisms exist. They're just not the cause of the behavior. Those are the two key takeaways here. Okay. Again, very simple concept on the surface, right? We just need to remember some basic things, okay, when discussing radical behaviorism and mentalisms.
All right. Thank you for watching. We'll be back next week with our continuation of our series. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. Be sure to like and subscribe. Let us know when you pass. Work hard. Study hard. See you soon.